to another interview of series of interviews conducted by the chemistry department university of colombo i am srimal gavijesekar who graduated this year and i will be interviewing professor david berata professor david berata is currently the rj reynolds professor of chemistry in the department of chemistry duke university and holds professorships in the department of physics and biochemistry as well He is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Chemistry of University of Pittsburgh. Good evening, Professor Berata. Thank you for giving us <coughs> a valuable time out of your hectic schedule for, to take part in this interview. To begin with, would you please give us a brief introduction about your background to science, for example, your early education and how it inspired uh, to subsequent development as a professor? Okay, very much. So, uh, my early, uh, early, early education and um, and background. So, I grew up on the east coast of the United States. Um, my my parents, my father was a civil engineer, and my mother uh, was a teacher. So, they they both had um, uh, the the benefits of of higher education. So, that was a great a great asset to me. Um, I think most uh, most children are curious about the world. And I was fortunate in that my my family was very encouraging of this curiosity. So I I ended up going to um, undergraduate university, actually here at Duke University, where I currently am on the faculty. So uh, we were living in Atlanta, Georgia, and Duke is not so far away from Atlanta. And I ended up I ended up coming here to study. Um, I I was always interested in foundational questions. Uh, and this drew me to chemistry, physics, mathematics, um, and I think I just had the most fun with chemistry, so I so I stuck with it. Um, then I went to graduate school to explore another part of the country, so I went to Queens Plus area, a strong area. So I, I studied there and did my PhD. So that's that's the sort of beginning of, of my my career. So then, actually, what inspired to become a scientist? Yeah, well, I would say. In a sense, all children are natural scientists, right? We're we're all curious about the world around us, and I think that um, uh, those of us who are lucky enough to have families that encourage our curiosity, we tend to continue to ask questions, and sometimes those questions lead towards uh, issues in the physical world. Uh, and that was the case with me. I uh, I enjoyed understanding how things work. And with an encouraging family, I kind of stuck with it, and this is where it led. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sir, could you please describe us the type of research work that you are currently focusing on? Okay, sure. So I'm a theoretical physical chemist, and what that means is I use the tools of uh, physics and mathematics to try to understand the under underpinnings of chemical processes, and so. Um, I'm particularly interested in how complex molecules function. Uh, for example, molecules in, in biology, how, um, how those molecules give rise to the function, the critical function uh, that occurs in our cells. I'm also interested in um, mm, mo molecules that could play uh, useful roles, say, in uh, solar energy harvesting, in energy science. Uh, or molecules that um, that could play an interesting role in biomedicine uh, to, for treating disease, for example. Yeah. Okay. Then, what made you specifically choose this particular fields? Yeah. So some of it is accidental. I, I mean, I was interested in chemistry and physics, and when I was studying chemistry, I, I asked one of my uh, professors. Um, uh, a sort of theoretical question uh, about how things worked. And he referred me to um, one of the recently hired theoretical chemists on the faculty. And so I started interacting with him and did independent study, independent research with him as a junior and senior in college and got kind of hooked on chemistry. So I think that was somewhat accidental. I would be urged by, by my professors to pursue uh, the things I was curious about. Then when I, so when I arrived in graduate school, I was, I was not certain if I would stay in theoretical chemistry or perhaps I'd pursue 
experimental physical chemistry. And one of the advantages at Caltech at the time and still today is they were strong in both in both areas. And um, when I arrived in graduate school, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. There may be half a dozen, maybe eight, I don't know, um, faculty uh, doing physical chemistry and chemical physics. And I, I spoke to all of them. And I, I ended up joining the group of a faculty member who seemed to be the most excited about what he was doing. So, so I think um, in my own case, this may not be generally true, but in my own case, I found that if I'm able to uh, study with and collaborate and work with, with, with other uh, scientists at all, in all age ranges who are excited about what they're doing, then good things tend to happen. So that was kind of the, the way in which I fell into a career in theoretical chemistry through a kind of um, a curiosity as an undergraduate and then a desire to work with, with people who were really excited about what they were doing. Yeah. Professor, you have mentioned uh, many research projects, uh, including physical chemistry and all. So do you think that you will continue working in these projects as you are doing now? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because in science, there's a tension between wanting to develop a deeper and deeper knowledge about a single question and the, the alternative, which is to use and leverage the things you've learned to move on and explore something that's totally new for you. Um, and in a sense, um, the, in the United States anyway, they're, they're the, the way the, the research funding system is set up you're, there are some rewards for remaining in one area, but um, but oftentimes uh, you can make larger you can make large contributions by by taking the skills you've learned in one area and uh, transplanting them to another area. So um, I think people find skill uh, find very successful careers uh, following both strategies: either focusing in on one problem for their whole careers or moving from topic to topic. Of course, not every week, but maybe every five years, maybe every 10 years. Um, and so what, what I find in my own science is um, from reading the literature, attending meetings, speaking with my colleagues and friends in science, um, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to, um, to learn about new challenges and new uh, unanswered questions in science. And sometimes you learn about those those questions, and you your background may not help you um, uh, contribute to answering those questions. But sometimes you'll find that um, that you have some knowledge or skills that give you a unique insight in these new areas. And so um, so oftentimes people will 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 move when they see um, that they have an advantage to deal with with a new question. And that, that's been the case for me. I would say in some sense, um, there's some projects I've worked on throughout my career that I, I, haven't, I haven't let go. There are other problems I've worked on, perhaps for five go and could to sing the questions I was interested in. Um, and we continue to pick up uh, new problems. Sometimes it can be uh, you know, a, a student walking through the door who says, I, I wanna learn about this and I, I wanna study it or, or a colleague may walk in and say, well, we're doing an experiment in this field and we really don't understand this aspect of the problem. So um, I think what, what you'll discover over time is, is science is a very human activity. So it's through these really often one-on-one -on -one interactions that you discover new opportunities. And so, so there's some problems I continue working on, but I hope something new and exciting will also come uh, to entice me. Yeah. I understand that you are currently involved in developing the theoretical, theoretical methods to navigate the vastness of molecular space. Could you please explain us briefly about the molecular space and how it interests you? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So um, the, the, the best way to, to, to address this is to, is to talk about the, uh, the number of compounds that you or your uh, synthetic chemistry friends could make if they went into the laboratory today, just using standard known reagents and known literature synthetic protocols, 
you could make on the scale of 10 to the power 60 different um, organic molecules with molecules below about 500. So very small molecules, not, not, not so large. Um, and it's because of the combinatorial um, richness that chemistry gives us that that number is ast truly astronomically large. And so um, if, you, you, if you consider all the compounds you could make, even beyond uh, uh, molecular weight of 500, um, uh, oh, and the, five, and the 10 to the 60 number comes only from uh, common elements in the first few rows of the periodic table. If you expanded that, that, um, those constraints further, you'd find that there are more compounds that you could make than there are atoms in the entire universe. So it's, it's truly an astronomical challenge. So now the question is, how do we decide what to make? Well, um, in human history, we've, we've discovered by, by accident or exploration uh, very valuable compounds, medicinal and otherwise, and we use those, of course. Um, and um, sometimes if we're um, trying to develop a drug, we may start with a known compound from nature and try to improve its characteristics. That's a very natural thing to do. Um, uh, an, another approach approach to uh, discovering valuable compounds is just to take life of compounds. Over human history, we've made millions, maybe um, uh, on the scale of 100 million different compounds. So you can actually buy libraries of compounds and screen them. So that's an approach. But it's um, from, from the sound of things already, you can imagine it's a very um, accidental process um, and one that requires incredible theorem to explore on our computers, for example, molecules in the space of 10 to the 60 possibilities and direct synthetic chemistry towards molecules that may be the most promising. Um, so we have, we have strategies for, uh, on our computers, uh, building representative libraries of these 10 to the 60 compounds. So that maybe instead of screening a million compounds uh, at random, maybe we could choose a million compounds that are as different from one another as, as possible. And then we might screen those experimentally. Um, or alternatively, our um, synthetic friends may have discovered a molecular scaffold that looks very promising for a medicinal chemistry application. And they can afford to go into the lab and make 100 or 1,000 new compounds based on that framework. Well, using our ideas about molecular libraries and molecular diversity, we might be able to advise them as to uh, how to invest their effort in those compounds so they would maximize their chances of finding a promising uh, species in their screening. So, so that's the basic idea. And I, I would describe it as a grand challenge style problem. Um, it's, uh, it's being tackled in many different ways. We've been using inverse design strategies in my own group, but machine learning, which is becoming very popular now, is, is playing a role in this, um, uh, in this addressing this challenge. Uh, I have colleagues here at Duke who are do, using uh, theoretical chemistry computation to do a kind of high, high throughput screening on their computers, um, building combinatorial libraries of compounds and solids and screening their properties computationally. So it, it's, a, it's an area of research that's, um, that's attracting greater interest. And um, I wouldn't say that anyone has, has had a, uh, what we would call a home run, a great, a great success in this area yet. So I think it's one with a lot of promise. You are not only a professor in chemistry, but also in physics. Can you tell us how chemistry links with physics and how understand this Borges Johns help you in your research and discoveries? Right. So it's kind of a funny accident of history that we have all these separate departments, chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics. Um, academics has became over the last few centuries very compartmentalized in these uh, divisions. They're very useful divisions from the standpoint of teaching courses, but research actually uh, uh, bleeds over these boundaries, uh, spreads over these boundaries between disciplines. So for example, in, in physical chemistry and chemical physics, um, we use the, uh, the theoretical foundations that come from physics to understand how atoms and molecules uh, 
are held together and how they carry out function, how they, how they do their jobs. So, um, so my connections here in physics are very important uh, because I, I may attract graduate students to my group who have a, a deep background in physics who are able to apply um, what they've learned in the physics curriculum to problems that interest me, say, in the function of uh, molecular machines in, in nature, in, in biology, um, where having a very firm uh, grasp of physical ideas uh, could be extremely helpful. So, in fact, theoretical chemistry borrows heavily from physics. And so, um, uh, so these links are really very strong. And I would say similarly, uh, I have a connection here with the Department of Biochemistry, and it's a similar sort of um, uh, uh, chemists are, are interested mainly in, in the macromolecules of, of nature, uh, but they're held together by the same chemical forces that we deal with in, in, our, in our chemistry curriculum. So, so just as I rely on physics, the biochemists may rely on the chemists to help them understand uh, problems that they face at the frontiers. So these, these boundaries that were established really centuries ago um, between the disciplines, are, they're very useful for structuring our teaching curriculum, but the research problems we deal with every day spread across all of these sub-disciplines. Yeah. So as I understood, uh, most of your research, research are leaning more towards the biological sites with nucleic acids and DNA taken into front line. So mm -hmm. how important do you think it is for students hoping to embark in the field of chemistry to know about biology. For me, yeah. being as a physical science student, wonders uh, if it is possible for me to engage in a engage in a research which involves biochemistry. Right, right, right. So, so right, a lot of our research, maybe I don't know, half or two thirds of my group is involved in studies that involve DNA and proteins, so very biological molecules. Um, I guess the, the first advice I'd give to an undergraduate or a beginning, even a beginning graduate student would be to, to build depth in the area that you're most excited about. So if you're, um, if you're studying physical chemistry, learn all the physical chemistry you can learn, deepen your knowledge as much as possible. But I would, I would definitely encourage those students um, to, to add some breadth to their background, to to um, diversify their training a little bit, uh, learn some biochemistry, learn some computer science, for sure learn as much mathematics and as much physics as you can fit into your day. Um, I know the way the curriculum was set up for me, it was very, very difficult, in fact, when I was an undergraduate to take courses in biochemistry. They weren't even organized in the same uh, college, the same academic unit as um, uh, as I was studying and the biochemistry courses were taught in a medical, si medical school department rather than an arts and sciences department. So it was very tough to, to access them. But I, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to explore these, these broader subjects, especially biochemistry. Uh, some things you can pick up by reading or taking an online course. It doesn't take um, a huge investment to become literate so that when you look in the literature and you see some of the applications of chemistry, physical chemistry, say, uh, to biochemistry, that you'd be able to appreciate it. So, you know, sometimes um, when, I'm, when I'm bringing biochemistry ideas into my courses, I encourage students just to use online tools to, to make sure they understand the terms. Even a Wikipedia search, quick Wikipedia search, can help you um, get oriented. Um, I think the challenge we all face now with science being as interdisciplinary as it is, is, is to figure out how to balance this, this question of training and depth versus uh, breadth between disciplines. And I think we, we struggle with it throughout our careers. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess, as I said, I, I would, um, I'd encourage students to build, to build as much depth in their core area uh, and then, and then think about diversifying. The, the the danger, I think, is that we can spread ourselves a little too thin too early on. So, uh, I mean, but at the at the end of the day, the more the more we know, the better off we are. So, uh, good to try to informally, uh, um, at least, try to to diversify what we learn. Some there's some easy things if you happen to be at a university. 
you can probably attend seminars in the, or the biochemistry department and pick up some of the knowledge of core ideas in a very, in a very uh, simple way, just by keeping your eyes open and uh, taking advantage of opportunities. Yeah. As a professor, what advice would you give for a student interested in pursuing science research as a career? That's a great question. I think you'll get um, different answers ev from every person you speak with. I'll give you an answer based on my own personal experience, which I, I told you about a little bit. Um, I, I, I've found that the best things have happened for me in terms of my own uh, development as a young scientist and development of my career, when I was able to surround myself with people who were really passionate about what they're doing, um, passionate about their research, serious about, about science, um, treating each other with respect and dignity. And um, I found that if I can find environments where, where there are some such people, like-minded people, then good things always happen. And that's been the case for me, whether it's uh, when I was younger and it was my, my PhD advisor or my undergraduate research advisor. But even as a, a faculty member here at Duke, I find that if I'm able to work with graduate students and postdocs who are really excited about what they're doing, really excited about coming to work every day, then good things always happen. So I think if you're, you know, if you're building, if you're building your knowledge and uh, having fun and working with passionate people every day, something good is going to happen for your science and, and for your career as well, I think. Professor, you were a part of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So can you tell us what it was like working in a project affiliated to NASA? Sure. That's... Um, that's kind of a funny story. So I did my PhD at Caltech in Pasadena, California, and uh, there's a NASA laboratory called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that's run for NASA by Caltech. It's about six miles distance from the campus. It's very, very close by, really. Um, and so um, uh, I, I chose to go there for many, many reasons after my PhD. I went first as a postdoc, and then I joined the staff there. Um, you might imagine that I was working on an exotic space project, mapping the surface of Venus or something like that, but it happens that I was not. Um, uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab has about uh, 6,000 employees. It's quite a large center. And uh, in fact, much larger, I guess, than Caltech itself. Um, and in addition to doing fabulous things in interplanetary exploration, they build unmanned spacecraft in particular. Um, uh, they also do quite a bit of basic research. And so when I worked there, I was in a group that was focused on uh, materials chemistry and materials science. And I was providing a little bit of theoretical support to those um, materials programs. And as it turns out, for most of my time at the lab, I was actually supported not by NASA, but by the Department of Energy. And I was uh, doing my early work on protein-mediated electron transfer uh, at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So um, although I was at a NASA laboratory and I was doing some research related to optical materials that could be used for communication that was relevant to NASA, most of my research was actually of a fairly fundamental nature and related to bioenergetics and um, electron transfer rather than um, um, it, was, it, it was a um, uh, a little niche there that you may find at, at these very large um, national laboratories um, that, that support a wide range of science activities. Yeah. As a fellow of America, uh, American Ad Association for Advancement of Science, what do you think should be done to make the world aware of, of importance of science? That's a, a great question and a really, a really hard one. Um, so I think for all of us uh, who study science and, and are, are working in science, we, we, we owe uh, our fellow citizens really a debt of explaining our, what we're doing. After all, they're supporting it financially. 
so we, we owe the, our community um, um, some effort uh, at explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what the benefits from long term to society may be as a result. So, um, so one way you know, one way we may do this for a general audience is by by doing various forms of outreach. We have so-called science cafes around uh, the city where I live. Some of my colleagues will go and participate in those science cafes, which are just open to the general public for um, uh, discussion of current research challenges. Um, another activity we've been involved with is creating um, museum exhibits, at uh, one at a museum in Durham, one at a museum um, in the Philadelphia area, uh, related to uh, the kinds of science we do. So, so I think we owe, we owe our, our fellow citizens this kind of um, uh, um, uh, outreach. Um, some of my colleagues may be called upon by, by government, government organizations to offer advice. And this is another sort of form, form of service and, and outreach um, that, that we may do um, in a more specialized sense that, that may not serve the, the general uh, audience, but um, the science audience. We, we also, from time to time, will write so-called review articles, articles that describe what we're doing for, for someone with a general, let's say, undergraduate level background in the sciences, but not uh, a super specialized background. So, we try to we try to do these things, and I, I think it's especially important today that we um, we uh, we communicate science clearly as clearly as we can. There are global challenges we all face um, with respect to uh, to climate change and and so forth. Where where we 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 really as scientists um, need need to articulate um, the facts of what's what's happening in the world. And um, and help people understand the sometimes challenging issues that underpin these 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 uh, facts. Okay. Yeah. And congratulations on receiving the 2018 Moray Godman Memorial Prize awarded for outstanding accomplishments in one or more areas of biochemistry, biophysical chemistry, biophysics, and chemical biology. Can you tell us what drives you to achieve such excellence in the field of science? Oh well, th thanks very much. Um, so, so I'm kind of an old guy. I just turned 60 years old, and so it's a it's really a privilege and an honor to receive these awards. But the funny thing is, um, I, I can't. I, you know, I, I really enjoy getting these awards. A a a anyone would, um, but I can't say that these are drivers for me. Um, I feel as though the award, in a sense, is given to me. Um, in part at least, for work I may have done 20 or 30 years ago. And if I think back to 20 or 30 years ago, I didn't even know that this, well, it, in fact, I knew Murray Goodman. He was a professor at UC, University of California, San Diego. But I had no idea there would be an award named for him. I had no idea of the other awards that might become available to me. And so I was doing the science that I did because I thought it was exciting. It was fun. As I, as I said earlier, I was embedded in this community, still am, of like-minded, enthusiastic fellow scientists. And so um, the, driver, the driver for me in, you know, in those days and still was, was, was the thrill of doing the science every day. And so um, that's, what, that's what drove me 20, 30 years ago, and that's what still drives me today. It's delightful to win, to win awards like this. But, but the, the real fun is going to work every day and you know, interacting with the students and doing the science, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. You have been fortunate enough to be a holder of many publications and hard enterprises. So do you keep constantly working and embarking one project after the other following the excellent work that you have done for the work? I see. So this is related a little bit to your earlier question about how we choose our problems and whether we decide to stay in one field or another. So um, I would say, I'll, I'll give a similar answer to what I said earlier. Um, so I am driven, uh, I'm driven by the excitement that the science produces for me. And, and after working in some of these areas for, for a number of years, I have 
intuition about whether they're accessible and exciting um, questions still to be answered, or whether, let's say, 90% of the understanding that may be available to me has already been achieved. So I tend to make the decisions about whether to continue pursuing a problem or to, or to shift towards another area based on my assessment of um, what the area has um, remaining to be learned. In the United States, anyway, there are trends in funding. So as times we'll see that there are external forces that will push us from one area to another. Um, uh, sometimes we have a, a long-standing, we may have a long-standing interest on a topic that's been out of fashion and then suddenly uh, uh, it comes into fashion among the funding agencies. Uh, an example of this might be quantum phenomena overall. There's great interest worldwide in quantum phenomena. A growth in research, um, uh, research funding in a particular area we may grow our activity in that area. It's something we've been working on and interested in for a while, but there might be an uptick in that research due to changes in funding availability. That's the, those, those changes are usually relatively minor um, uh, on top of the, um, this kind of constant assessment of, of where the, the, the greatest challenges and opportunities are for us in science. So I would say we're pulled in many directions. We'll stick with some things where we feel there's still quite a bit to be learned. Um, but for problems where we feel we've learned, you know, 85, 90% of what, what we, we may be able to learn in the near future, we may drop it because, you know, there are only 24 hours in the day and resources are, are finite. So we have to make strategic choices. Yeah. Professor, my next question is going to be the future of chemistry. Then what areas would you think will be the future of chemistry and why would you think so? Yeah, well, gosh, it's, it's, it's really hard for me uh, to answer that question. Um, so, I, you know, I think that uh, from my own point of view in theoretical chemistry, that, that opportunities in theoretical chemistry will continue to grow with the continued exponential growth in computational power and in the development of um, new algorithms that let us calculate uh, the properties of molecules with, with increasing accuracy. Um, so I think opportunities in theoretical chemistry will, will always abound, will continue to grow and will abound. Um, um, I think chemistry at its core, although I'm not a synthetic chemist, is always going to be about making things. So I think there will always be opportunities for people who are able to put together atoms into bonds and create novel architectures, whether it's small molecules that might serve as drugs or larger scale um, nanoscale objects that might have interesting uh, properties and materials. I think that will that will always um, those skills will always be valuable, and there will always be uh, opportunities for measuring the properties of these uh, nanometer scale objects, uh, characterizing them and quantifying what they are and how they work. So that will always be uh, an, an interesting direction. And I think, frankly, when it comes to biochemistry and molecular biophysics, um, there will be great challenges associated with um, understanding how these macromolecular machineries, uh, machines uh, function, really, at the level of atoms and in interatomic and intermolecular interactions. So I think there are great opportunities. There will be great opportunities going forward in uh, molecular biophysics and in understanding molecular function. And then, of course, there are, um, there are areas at the edges of, of chemistry uh, interfacing with, uh, with neuroscience, for example, um, and engineering, perhaps, biomedicine, where, where chemistry really will, 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 will be able to play an important role. We, we, we like to claim that chemistry is the central science, and I think um, if you look around my university today, what you're seeing is that um, uh, departments in the School of Medicine, the School of Engineering, um, for example, they're hiring chemists. Che che chemists are becoming, so much of science and engineering is becoming molecular uh, in its very nature that, that chemistry is kind of um, 
uh, becoming universally valuable across the engineering and disciplines and, and, and all the sciences. So I think that's a trend we'll continue to see as well. Professor, you have mentioned a lot of areas in the future. So what pathways would you recommend the students to pursue, which hasn't been traded on, on as yet, but promise more scope in the future? Yeah, well, that's, that is related to some of your earlier questions. I guess first I'd say if I could identify these, I would try to jump into them myself. Uh, so uh, um, I, I guess um, I'll answer it indirectly. Um, I would say that as a young scientist and even as a faculty member, uh, it's easy to be overwhelmed, right? It's easy to be overwhelmed by the, the vast nature of the chemical literature, um, the seemingly endless um, uh, depth of, of human knowledge that's accumulated over time. And so um, my encouragement uh, for, for finding a pathway would be find a problem that you're really uh, excited about, that you're, you're intrinsically excited about uh, exploring, and one that can bring you into contact, as I mentioned earlier, with other like-minded people who are also fascinated and excited to be exploring that problem. Even if that problem turns out um, only to be one that you stick with for a short period of time, what you'll discover is science is so interconnected. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And um, you'll find that if you, if you chose a, a topic that is really important and really keeps your excitement, uh, you'll, you may stick with it. But you'll find that just being engaged in the process, you'll have so many opportunities that come up uh, from talking to other people, from attending conferences, from attending seminars, from reading the literature, that if you find your, your initial problem, well, really isn't as exciting as you thought it might be or hoped it might be, you'll be able to shift quite, quite readily. So, so I guess my, I'll be a little bit evasive and, uh, and avoid suggesting a specific pathway, but I, I'll suggest more of a, a mode of study or a mode of um, uh, leading your research life so that you're open-minded to new opportunities and you're interacting with, with other people who are really fascinated by science and scientific questions. And, and then I think you'll find a pathway that suits you personally, that, that, you'll, that will keep you, keep you excited and keep you sort of running to the office every day. Okay. And Professor, my next question is going to be a common question for all the graduates. It's like uh, they can perform well in their research activities, but when it comes to their academic paper-based examination, they can perform well uh, due, to, due to some reasons. So they might scared whether and they don't like actually they don't like to give up give up in their career after a long run long and hard run so they they are like scared whether they will be able to get into a good university and do their higher studies mm -hmm. so what would be the best advice from you to give them to inspire them mm. so these are students uh who are having a sort of self-doubt about their careers is that what you you mean yeah yeah, so, um, so I, I'm not sure what the education system is like in your own country. I can, I, can speak, I can speak to this better in the context that I'm familiar with in the United States. So I would say all of us, um, well, more generally, all of us have self-doubt from time to time. And so that's very natural. So I wouldn't be... Uh, uh, if, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, that's very, that's very human and, and, uh, and very natural. Um, if, if, you're, if you're excited about, about science and pursuing your studies, I'd encourage you to, to keep going. I think all of us have had setbacks. We've had bad days taking exams. Uh, we've, sometimes we just make the wrong decision. Um, what, I was, what I was going to say about education in the U.S., is there, 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 are, there are second chances. So even if you make a bad decision or you have a bad day and the exam goes poorly, um, there, there, there are usually in life multiple opportunities. So if you're really passionate about uh, pursuing a career in science, I would encourage you to keep, to keep going, even if you hit a setback. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, 
you know, we've all we've we've all been by the, by this point as students, as faculty members, we're um, we've all been rejected in whether it's in college applications or grant applications, papers that have submitted we've submitted. Um, in a sense, when when I when I talk to my colleagues about these kind of setbacks, I I, I don't know if baseball is is part, but. Uh, it, maybe not, but in, in baseball, uh, it turns out you can you can fail 60% um, uh, of the time, so you can have a batting average of uh, 0.4, and you'd still be considered uh, a superstar in baseball. So I think uh, scholarship is similar. We actually uh, fail in you know most of the time when I write a grant proposal, even even at my career stage, most of the time when I write a grant proposal, it will be rejected. Um, Mostly when I write a, a paper and submit it to a journal, it's going to come back with a suggestion that it be extensively revised. So, um, so part, of, part of pursuing a career in science is, is learning to deal with these bumps. And uh, I guess uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not excited about, um, about doing the science, well, maybe you should look for another career. But if, you're, if you are uh, passionate about the um, the questions you might be able to attack with a, a career in science, then I'd encourage you to, you know, just uh, pull yourself up and 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 you know give things another shot and, and keep going. We, we all have these we all have these setbacks. I've had plenty. Yeah. Uh, at last but not least, is there anything else that you would like to tell, inspire the Virginian scientists who are looking forward to entering to the exciting field of research? I think I'd go back to my earlier comment that if uh, if you can place yourself in an environment where you're surrounded by by colleagues, uh, advisors, faculty, fellow students, as well as the younger students who are really excited by what they're doing every day, then something great is going to come out of it. I'm, I'm sure of that. Where you know, no matter where you are on Earth. Uh, no matter what university, a very famous one or one that's maybe less famous, uh, if, if you're working together a hard every day with people who are excited about what they're doing, then, then something really good is going to happen. So that, that would be my strongest advice. That's the, if I look for um, times in my life when the, you know, the best scientific outcome occurred, it was always when I had a, a, either a collaborator or a student or, or an advisor who is really passionate about what you're doing. And um, whether you're in campus, that's the advice that's universal from, from my experience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Baratton, for giving us your valuable time. I believe that this interview has shown us so some unseen dimensions of the life of a professor that inspires us to do well in science. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So. Let's wrap things up. Today we have interviewed Professor David Baratton from the Department of Chemistry, Duke University. We really appreciate that he was able to allocate his valuable time giving us to this interview. Thank you for joining us today for the second interview of Minute to Follow. Hope you will look forward to seeing our next videos. Have a great day.